Uh, we are very pleased to have with us this afternoon uh, Matthew Stone and Kim Griffin from Stone Olufsen, uh, who will be sharing the, the most recent results of their longitudinal study. Uh, the Edmonton Arts Council acknowledges the traditional land on which Edmonton Amoskwichi Askahegan sits, the territory of the Treaty Six First Nations, and the homelands of the Métis people. We would like to recognize and thank the diverse Indigenous peoples whose ancestors' footsteps have marked this territory for centuries, such as the Nehewak Cree, Dene Sulene, Nakota Sioux, Soto, Nitsitape, Blackfoot, as well as the Metis and the Inuk Inuit peoples. It is a welcoming place for all people who come together around the world, from around the world, to share Edmonton as a home. Together, we call upon all of our collective honored traditions and spirits to work in building a great city for today and for future generations. Um, thank, please join me in uh, welcoming uh, Matthew and Kim. I'm going to turn it over now to Matt. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you for having us today. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to share my screen. And welcome to our viewers today. And uh, we're very pleased to be here. This is, uh, as David mentioned, the last of our our most recent phase of work. We're hoping to continue in the fall. We'll see how that goes, but on the new experience economy. And before we uh, jump into some of the results, um, just like to thank the supporters who have made this work possible. Um, the whole point of this is to ensure that leaders like yourselves have the data you need in order to be able to make informed decisions and fuel your own recovery moving forward. Um, we know that this is a challenging time. So we'd like to thank these organizations in particular, the Edmonton Arts Council and the Edmonton Community Foundation for their work in supporting organizations in Edmonton. Um, now, part of this work, as David mentioned, is that this is a longitudinal study. And this is a little different than what we typically see in that uh, we're conducting the same phase of research throughout uh, the whole pandemic starting last June uh, and continuing on until this June and now into August. Um, this phase of work that we're going to be sharing with you today represents the findings of uh, 1,333 surveys with Albertans aged 18 years and older. Um, as I mentioned earlier, longitudinal means we're going to be going back to the same group of people. This phase, we recovered 75% of the respondents. That means 75% of people participating in this study participated in previous waves as well. Um, as you can see on the right, we've completed uh, very specific quotas to ensure that we're able to get um, specific uh, results for uh, markets, particularly Edmonton and Calgary. The results we're gonna show you today are focused on Edmonton. We're gonna show you how that compares to the rest of the province, but there, everything is weighted and balanced for age and gender. And uh, the final data is weighted to match the census profiling from Statistics Canada. So what that means at the end of the day is, is that everything you're looking at uh, represents and looks like the rest of the population of Edmonton and Alberta. All of this data was collected in June, from June 4th to June 21st. And um, it's the sixth of uh, six waves. So we're looking to move forward. Now, one thing that's really important in this kind of research is that it doesn't exist in a vacuum and exists in context around us. And by now we're all familiar with this kind of chart. Uh, the red line represents the active cases of COVID-19 during the pandemic. And the gray bars that you see there can show you the different phases of work. We have timed each of these phases of research very deliberately so that we can get a sense of longitudinal predictability as much as possible. Research is always a snapshot in time, but um, throughout the pandemic, it's been a, a period, an era of uncertainty. We're not sure what's going to happen or how caseloads manage, but because of where things are at um, with the research and how things have progressed with caseloads, we're able to have some sense of understanding about where things might go if case numbers are surging. Um, by the time this research was done, the, the active uh, cases from that third wave the second wave were in serious decline um, and but they're re rebounding today well what's interesting to note is you can see that we're up as of today at the 2176 active cases but hospitalizations remain quite low at 90 uh, overall so obviously the impact of the vaccine is having uh, some bearing on those overall statistics and you'll see that it actually has a bearing on how people feel uh, about re-engaging with the experience economy so with that, let's start with talking about comfort levels, risk tolerance, and the consumer mindset. This is a completely new dynamic that's been brought on by the, the pandemic. And now as leaders in the experience economy, we have to do more to deal with comfort and risk taking and their mindset, whereas before we just had to worry about availability and cost. So what does comfort level looks like. Um, it's interesting to note that comfort, and you can see throughout the pandemic, has uh, ebbed and flowed. Um, right now we're seeing at 28% in Edmonton who have high comfort with large groups again, 
about 56% right in the middle, and 15% uh, low comfort. So we're starting to see what we might consider to be a baseline, given where vaccinations are at, about how audiences are going to feel in crowds. The reason why this is important, however, is, is that as leaders, we need to make sure that we're not um, just working to capture 100% of the audience anymore. Right now, we know if you're an event that's operating with larger capacity and having larger crowds, there's going to be 15% who are just not on the table and not available anymore. They're in low comfort. They only want to stay with themselves or engage in their solitary activities. But the balance are uh, moving into other categories. So um, we see the high comfort growing and the medium comfort, the larger uh, segment in the middle there, who are comfortable with their own social groups. So they might be more amenable to participating that way. Now, um, this is different. Edmonton is much slower paced than the rest of the province. We know that on an average, 38% are in the high comfort large groups. And this is very consistent throughout the pandemic, whereas audiences at Edmonton have been much more hesitant and less comfortable with large crowds than we have seen in other markets of Alberta, particularly northern and central Alberta, where comfort levels have always been very, very high. Now, as we track this throughout the pandemic, you can see right now that, yes, we still have um, in Edmonton the largest proportion at 28% who are comfortable with large groups. And this is the highest we've ever received. But again, remember that it's 28% and the bulk of our market is still mainly comfortable with their own social groups. This is a reminder that while restrictions have lifted, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a few minutes, not everyone is going to be rushing through the door. So the door might be open, restrictions may be lifted, but not everybody's going to be going back. There's going to be some hesitancy that lingers for quite some time. Now, one thing that's been really important throughout this is been watching the difference between risk tolerance and comfort. So as, if you've been following the work, you'll know that we've had a lot of discussion about comfort being a mindset that helps people uh, in terms of making, uh, considering different options. But the risk tolerances that audience have can be the difference between consideration and action. We calculate risk tolerance, just as a quick refresher, based on three variables. People's propensity for day-to-day -day risk, their tolerance for risk, particularly as it relates to COVID. So do they have the capacity to uh, endure severe conditions or not as a result of getting COVID? And then the trade-offs they make in, in terms of risk and experiences. What is the risk reward? So they value experiences more than the risk. And we combine that to be able to get three categories of audiences, risk takers who are eager and raring to go, risk reducers who are the bulk of the population at 61% in Edmonton right now, who are very careful, eager to do things, but still very careful. And then the risk avoiders. Risk avoiders are those who have very low tolerance and low capacity for risk, um, higher incidences or potential for health risks. Uh, they're very concerned about their own health more than anything else. Whereas risk reducers, they're most concerned about getting other people sick, whereas risk takers are mostly concerned about uh, the impact on their experiences. They're not even worried about the risk. Edmonton continues to stand out as having fewer risk takers at 23% than the rest of the province at 30% across Alberta. And if we compare that to Northern Alberta as an example, Northern Alberta has much higher proportions of risk taking uh, populations than we see in Edmonton. Part of that is economic impact. As we've noted in the previous waves is that those who have been disproportionately impacted by uh, either the pandemic or the crash in oil prices in 2020 um, have a higher desire to see things get back to normal. So they're willing to go out and take the risk to get back and do things. That's absolutely critical. So what's interesting for us here is that we're starting to see finally um, risk move. In the pandemic, we didn't see risk taking behavior shift all that much, but now they're really moving for the first time. Now, key to all of this, and this is all fluctuating with caseloads. When we look at the caseloads and the case numbers and hospitalizations, um, as case numbers went up and hospitalizations went up, comfort went down, risk taking went down a little bit. But now that case numbers have gone right down, risk taking is going up. But the other factor here is vaccinations, which is going to be important to watch for the longer term. One of the things that we ask in the survey is to understand at what point do you need to feel comfortable in order to react? So how many, what proportion of the population do you need to see vaccinated in order to feel comfortable in participating in activities again? And on across the overall, we see that on average, Edmontonians say that they'll be comfortable participating in events when they see at least 67% who have a first dose and at least 59% who are fully vaccinated. This is gonna be absolutely critical. And uh, what's really important is that we know that vaccinations have actually surpassed those levels where most are gonna feel comfortable. Um, the latest statistics show us that 76% of Albertans have at least received at least one dose of adult 12 plus, sorry, population who is 12 plus, not just adults, um, as well as 65% of the population who is 12 plus who are fully vaccinated. So the question becomes from a planning perspective, 
at what point do people want to come back? And we seem to be at a level, but there's going to be hesitancy. So one of the big takeaways at this point that we really want to watch is that, yes, conditions are becoming much more favorable to audience engagement. Again, audiences are considering and looking at things. And as Kim will talk about, there's some pent up interest for activities and getting going again. But some things that you're going to have to consider. First off, do not assume that while case numbers are gone down, vaccinations are up, restrictions are off, that people's comfort is going to go right back to zero. It's or right to 100%. Comfort is not rebounding in the same way. There's not the elasticity that we would have liked to have seen. Um, there's going to be hesitancy in the market. It's also going to be important to keep assuring of safety and building comfort. This is going to be an ongoing activity for all types of audiences, but particularly those in the arts and culture sector where audiences are less uh, comfortable and hesitancy is much higher. So organizations have to spend time um, to explain what we're doing to keep you safe. These are the things that we're doing and we care about your safety. Um, at the end of the day, some time and patience are going to be required. Um, there's a great article in the Edmonton Journal about this, where it's going to take longer for the arts community to step up and get back to uh, some semblance of normal in terms of capacity. We're seeing that here, um, but there is increased interest. Now, um, putting aside comfort and uh, risk taking and vaccinations, uh, we wanted to understand more about the pace of restrictions and uh, our Albertans are going to be returning. Ultimately, Albertans or an independent group, and we're gonna to return to things at our own pace. When we asked first off about feeling, people's feelings about Alberta's reopening plan, and remember this is when reopening plans were just announced, um, there's about 32% who are saying excited and I can't wait to get going, but the bulk of the audience wasn't quite there. 39% uh, in the middle, and in fact, we even had a third, just about a third at 29% who were telling us, you know what, I'm anxious or afraid about what's gonna happen. And Edmonton, um, stands out. Uh, this is uh, much lower ratings of excitement, uh, much higher uh, feelings of anxiousness uh, or fear than we see in other parts of the province. In fact, 43% of Albertans widely are more eager to get going, things going. And that's brought up, obviously, by audiences in rural areas more than urban centres. Now, that excitement towards the reopening plan is um, tempered. And I think there's uh, a tendency by leaders to look at it and say, well, wow, okay, well, people are ready to go. There's pent up demand. Let's go. Well, that is uh, certainly there are 33% who are telling us I'm ready to go. Keep in mind that the bulk of the audience falls at the lower end of the spectrum from seven all the way down to one anxiousness. So our audience is telling us, yes, while restrictions are there, I'm not quite ready to go. Now their attitudes reinforce that. And Edmontonians carry views that are slightly different than what we see for the rest of the province. Um, personally, 67% uh, told us that they're not gonna fully participate in activities or experiences until they've had their a second vaccination. And we know where second vaccination numbers are at now. So we're starting to get to a tipping point of the market that's starting to tap into. Um, yes, there is excitement. 61% were telling us I'm excited to get back to normal as early as next month, so now. Uh, that's weaker than what we see for the rest of the population at 69%. Um, again, more prevalent in Edmonton is um, hesitancy. The only 53% or not only a significant proportion, 53% are telling us, I'm not comfortable with the pace of reopening, it's too fast. So Albertans, in particular Edmontonians, are telling us, wow, we want to see things move along at a little bit of a slower pace. Um, and that has a direct output of a lot of the communications that have been in place for the last year. Um, we have 31% who are telling us I won't attend outdoor events if I have to wear a mask. So as we've tracked earlier, um, smaller Edmontonians are willing to uh, participate even when they have to follow those restrictions. And masking is one of those things at 31%. So um, again, ultimately, Edmontonians are showing us a lot of hesitancy and how they want to engage. Now, that's not to say they don't necessarily view things the same way. 55% are telling us that you know what, these events and activities need to go ahead, even if not everyone is comfortable. So there's general recognition. That's not quite as strong as what we see for the rest of the province, but um, that doesn't necessarily always translate. So there's a general recognition that things need to happen, but uh, impressions of organizations that start to prepare for summer activities aren't quite necessarily as positive. On the whole, 30% of Edmontonians are telling us they have a very positive impression of brands that go and participate whereas 26% a quarter um, are viewing at a negative. And a great example of this is the uh, recent Calgary Stampede or even the uh, fun fair put on by Explore Edmonton on the Midway at Northlands Park, um, the old uh, K-Days. And ultimately there's gonna be mixed audiences and how they react to that. And we certainly saw that in Calgary during the Stampede where not everybody was on board and we're gonna see certain segments of the audience. 
Uh, part of that audience is going to be the risk taking uh, and the, some of the risk avoiders, but uh, or the risk reducers, but mainly risk taking Albertans who really want to get back to normal, and they tend to be younger. Now, part of this mindset is um, that sense of optimism, and it is certainly growing uh, significantly at 45%. That's up significantly from before. But we still see a slew of negative uh, impressions or, and, and uh, emotions still in the market. Frustration is still significant. People are very tired. Um, there's annoying, impatient, stressed, and worried that are starting to creep in or stay creeping into the um, and mindset of the consumer, and there's still a palpable amount of anger, 20-20% who are saying that. These are critical to watch because these are uh, the mindset of your consumer as they're coming in, and how they're feeling is also going to be um, key to how they receive marketing materials or how they're likely to respond to programming choices you make. Again, this is not likely to be the period where we're going to have challenging uh, artwork or cultural experiences. More optimistic, slightly lighter, are likely to offer a little bit more appeal than some of those other ones, just given the negative um, emotions in the market. So what does that mean? Um, ultimately, the removal of restrictions doesn't necessarily translate to the audience immediately coming back, as Kim is going to talk to. There's bent up interest, but it's not the same as demand. Um, the hesitancy is still there. Edmontonians and Albertans are going to return at their own pace. And they're just re-engaging more slowly than we might see in other parts of the province. So for all the news coverage you see of outdoor events in, let's say, a rural area in, in northern Alberta, Edmonton is going to look a lot different. So some things that you're going to want to keep in mind. Keep that audience sentiment first and foremost in your mindset. Uh, even though government policies are, are changing, mindset is taking slower to move along. Um, second point is, is that there's going to be reputational challenges among the hesitant audiences. Those who aren't as comfortable just aren't going to necessarily be as receptive or as view organizations so positively. So your messaging that's going to ease comfort, uh, ease concerns, build comfort, ease concerns is going to be absolutely critical. Um, there's still organizations who, to our last point, who are going to benefit from offering hybrid offers. So a great example will be some music series that we're seeing in Calgary and in other parts of the province where festivals are offering a hybrid option for audiences to participate while implementing a strong suite of social distancing and uh, safety measures as well. So look at these things because while the restrictions are off, the consumer isn't necessarily there. Kim. All right, thank you, Matthew. So what I'd like to do now is shift our attention to how do we capture some of that pent up interest or some of that demand that we're seeing from audiences? And it's gonna be a combination of a number of things. So first of all, what's really interesting is when we asked this question back in March, which was our last phase of work, 82% of Edmontonians said, I can't wait to discover rediscover the experiences, activities, events in my community. That's actually softened just a little bit to 74%. And that's also happened across the province. So I think what's happened is we've gotten a little close to that finish line, so to speak. And people kind of go, oh, wait, I'm not quite ready. And going back to some of the hesitation that Matthew's talked about, right? So there's an excitement, but a hesitation and a nervousness. And we're seeing that. Um, so again, audiences are, are ready to reconnect. They, or sorry, they want to reconnect, but it's going to be a balance. And another thing to keep in mind is 62% of Edmontonians say, well, because of the pandemic, I've discovered activities I can do on my own. And so we refer to those as self-directed activities. Um, and that's really now your new competition in some respects. So we've had Albertans and Edmontonians who have discovered new hobbies, new things to do. Um, some of those are gonna be left behind. They felt very pandemic specific. But others, I mean, there's plenty of people who've discovered something new that they love to do. So now that experiences and attractions are opening back up, um, there's kind of a new competitive set. So it's going to be a balance for Albertans and Edmontonians between rediscovering the old things that they used to do and continuing new. And the, the challenge for organizations is making sure you get your fair share or you know, kind of making sure you can get in front of an audience, an old audience, and make, making sure that they return to you. So when we start to look at some of the activities that uh, Edmontonians are going to consider, what we see is that pent up interest is really highest for travel, particularly within Alberta. And that really aligns well with uh, data that you've seen in, in other industries or the travel industry, that this notion that travel is one of the things that people have missed most. And, and we know it's going to start close to home. Um, 
What I will note is that um, things such as live performances, festivals, some of the areas that many of, of you might be working in are quite low on the list for consideration. Now I wanna point out that we've asked these items among people that actually do these things. So this is your audience. So if you offer live performances, um, that is your audience. And there's really 25% of Edmontonians that attend live performances that are ready to just get going as soon as the doors open to a theater or to a concert. That is a fairly small proportion. And so there's a lot of hesitancy just to keep, continue to build on what Matthew was talking about uh, in the market. Uh, I also want to point out that I'm showing you some Edmonton data. This is consistent in terms of order and magnitude with the rest of the province, but con the consideration, the proportions of those who say as soon as it's open, I'm going, is considerably uh, smaller, shorter in Edmonton compared to the rest of the province. So you really just knock off several percentage points to get these numbers for Edmonton means. Okay, so if we know that that's the lay of the land, uh, what do we know, what, those, particularly those who say, I'm not quite ready to go yet, what do cautious Edmontonians need to see to help move them along? Um, a lot of this is going to be information that Matthew's already talked about. And the top items that you're seeing are being fully vaccinated with both shots. 81% say this is going to increase my consideration to do an activity I love. 72% see, say seeing the majority of Albertans fully vaccinated and 66 say monitoring COVID statistics. So whether that's case numbers or hospitalization. These are about pandemic statistics, right? So these are the things that you can use to guide your organization's expectations for engagement. We know, as Matthew talked about, vaccination rates are, are relatively high and, 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 and at least above the threshold of where people said they wanted to see them. COVID statistics, a lot of the, we had declining case numbers for a long time. Those are slowly starting to rise. Where that lands, we don't know. Um, but that is a consideration, right? These are the things you may not be able to control, but you need to have a pulse on. The next few things in the list, things like, if you just go back for one second, um, ensuring safety measures are in place, knowing there's a flexible and easy cancellation policy. These are things, uh, these are safety measures, communication elements, these focus on the organization. These are things you can control a little bit better. And so you wanna consider showing your audiences. So that's what Edmontonians say they need to see, but what can you actually say to encourage att attendance? Um, so there's a couple things here. They're just keep, that they're just keeping me safe. 41% say that this is really, really important. So these are some of the same themes um, that we've seen before. On the flip side, 31% say, I just need to know that they're open. That's a little bit of that polarization. And again, in Edmonton, you can see that the safety message holds much greater sway than just um, those who say, I just want to know that the doors are open. And you can see how these numbers compare to the rest of Albertans. Um, Edmonton has a considerably or a slightly higher number of, of audience members who say, I just want to, I want to know that they're keeping me safe. For the rest, it's a mix of talking about your benefits, the things that you can deliver, and some of the current concerns, again, around safety, things like, um, it will be easy for me to get time tickets. But if you looked kind of the middle of the list, uh, communicating that this will be an escape, that it's an experience I'll be able to share, that I'll be able to interact or socialize, that it gives me a sense of normalcy. These are about the benefits of what your organization can offer. So when you think about your messaging, it has to align with changing consumer expectation. And there'll be a balance between talking about the benefits you offer with some of the more current concerns around safety and flexibility. Okay, so now um, whether people, whether Edmontonians are planning to move forward with an activity or they're still in that wait and see mode, they're more likely to want to hear from you. And here's what I mean by that. 72% say that now that things are starting to open, I'm looking forward to hearing from organizations about what, what will they uh, offer. Um, that is much higher than the 60% that say I'm actively planning what activities I will participate in this summer. So Edmontonians are a little bit more passive at this point. They are looking to hear directly from you as opposed to hopping off their couch, seeking out, exploring on their own. And I think this reflects that 67% who say when it comes to participating activities, I'm still in wait and see mode. So that goes back to that hesitancy we're seeing. Um, 
right now they need to have a compelling reason to engage and right and for many they're just kind of in that sitting back mode just waiting to see what happens so okay if we were to sum this up when it comes to converting that pent-up interest that we know is there it's going to be all about balance um, organizations are going to have to look at adjusting messaging talking about your benefits but also some of the practical concerns like safety, flexibility, and changing some of your operations to navigate our current environment. So messaging should change and policies may need to change if you haven't done that. There's new expectations around flexibility that I don't think will be going away anytime soon. The idea that you can easily get a refund or reschedule, all of those things, particularly with the Edmonton market, might need to be considered. So I saw a question here. I just want to see if I can address it. What is the age spread of respondents? So this was a representative sample by age and gender, and we weighted it. So it reflects the, um, the population of Alberta. I don't have the exact percentages off the top of my head, but we can certainly look that up. And I will say, too, that um, younger audiences tend to be a little bit more eager, tend to be a little bit higher on the risk taker as a risk taker a little bit more higher on the risk tolerance scale part of that reflects that reflects two things that reflects um the notion that that's a group younger albertans that has been disproportionately impacted by covid like losing jobs uh, reduction in income so they're a little bit more keen to get back to normal um they're also younger tends to be healthier right this notion you've seen it out in the media that covid will affect them less so that so when you look at your audience and you and you can consider what the age spread of your audience is that will shift things as well okay spending is the one area that we wanted to make sure we touched on in this last phase of work because it's something all organizations are grappling with like what can we expect and at the end of the day i can tell you that um it's clear that this is the landscape is quite different um, Edmontonians as well as Albertans now view money differently and spending habits have certainly changed. What I wish I could tell you is what this means for organizations and I think that's still in flux. In flux, sorry. 63% uh, say I may have spent less on activities and experiences but anything I've saved I've put towards other things. And this is a really interesting idea because there has been this notion out there uh, at least for in the previous months that there's a lot of pent up uh, saving that people have money ready to go and they're ready to spend when the doors open and I think that's been debunked a little bit um, because as time has gone on people have reinvested that money and you see here 63 percent agree with that into other things the rise of hobbies home renovations all of those things people have kind of redirected so they may not have the funds to just redirect into experiences. And a full 56% of Edmontonians say my spending habits are very different from before the pandemic started. Again, what that means for organizations, it's difficult to say right now, um, but I think just understanding that the way people are thinking about money and spending has shifted dramatically is where you have to temper your expectations. 48% say the pandemic's helped me save and I'm gonna continue this habit. So if we have 48% who are saving more, uh, not that that's a, a bad thing in any, anyway, but that means there might be less money available to redirect to experiences. So expectations should be a little bit more muted with respect to how Edmontonians will spend at least in the short term. So the pandemic has already made clear that the expectations Edmontonians have from more organizations have shifted. Um, so if you're going to encourage somebody to spend with you, what do you need to tell them? And again, it's all about re reinforcing transparency. So at the operate organizational level, uh, reassurances about flexibility, um, coupled with incentives, right? I mean, everyone loves a deal, so it's no surprise here, but if you can entice me to spend with you by offering a promotion or something like that, that might, um, entice Edmontonians to spend. 35% of Edmontonians say, I wanna make sure I have an opportunity for a refund. If I just feel unsafe in an event, that's higher than the rest of Alberta. And that's an interesting notion. That's not just about a easy cancellation policy. That's about saying, I went to an event, I didn't like it. Um, so there's some reputational elements that might go in, into play with that. But again, it's about communication, flexibility and incentives. So, Spending habits are in flux right now. And as we noted, savings might have increased, but it doesn't necessarily translate into readiness to spend because there's been a lot of diversion of spending. Uh, we also need to think about the fact that there have been changes in income, right? There's been a, a large 
or at least a significant proportion of Albertans who've had their income reduced in the past 16 months. Um, younger audiences, as I mentioned, and risk takers are more likely to want to re-engage, but they're also more likely to have had their income disrupted. So even if they, you open your doors and, and you know that this is a big proportion of your audience and they come to visit you, they may not have the money to spend in the same way. So what do you need to consider? Well, in some ways you just need to lower expectations, uh, prepare for a lower spending, at least in the short term, short term. Still think about some of those things I had mentioned earlier in terms of flexibility and payment options. These are still important. And then just in terms of inducing spending in the short term, what kind of value offers make sense to offer to your participants or your audience members? These are some of the things that might help move the needle at least in the short term. So that really wraps up um, what we've found and what we've discovered here in this final phase of work. Um, we wanna leave you with a couple thoughts as we reflect back on uh, over a year of, of work, of research and of findings. Um, it's been tremendous to do this type of work and really there is no crystal ball here, but we've, we've discovered a number of different things. Uh, the first one here is that, is all about adaptation, right? Um, we know mindsets have changed. We know habits have changed. That's not up for debate. We also have economic variables in play. We have a re reduction of income in, in certain pockets of the population, um, spending habits in flux. So it's all about adapting. Organizations will need to adapt programming and messaging so you can drive that re-engagement and prepare for the fact that it might look different. Yeah, the, the whole point of adaptation and innovation that Kim was talking about, that was a trend that was existing during the pandemic. Early on in the pandemic, there was lots of debate and discussion around, oh, people's values are going to change, or this is going to be a, a generational defining event. While it certainly is generational defining, uh, its impact is not necessarily on values. That's not how values work, but habits have changed. And trends that were existing before the pandemic have just been significantly accelerated. Uh, the move towards digital offerings, accelerated. Uh, flexible work accelerated. And in the experience economy, one of the big trends that was before the pandemic was this whole idea of adaptation or innovation. And ultimately what it meant was organizations uh, biggest challenge in getting repeat visitation was offering the same thing over and over again. Yes, there's an element of comfort that comes with offering the same, but audiences were, did not necessarily want to see it. They want to be surprised. They want to see something different or see a different side of an experience they love. Um, that trend has just been accelerated in the pandemic as organizations who have done exceptionally well at engaging audiences are those that have adapted what they offered into a digital environment or changed the on-site experience to make people feel safe or to change the pre-purchase ex uh, uh, experience as well. So that's absolutely key and organizations need to keep considering it because I don't think that uh, the results aren't showing that audiences are necessarily going to move away from that desire or that trend. Um, I think the other thing that's really critical here is the why of your organization and the why of your audiences have never been more important. This was a, a trend that was highlighted early in the pandemic and was helpful for helping organizations adapt. In particular, what it means is, is that you need to have a very good sense of why you are operating and the offer that you have. You need to also have a very good sense of why your audience is there. I'm not talking about features, we're talking about the benefits. What do they get out of it? Why do they want to be there in the first place? And having clarity on that provides a bit more of a North Star, particularly in a turbulent environment where audience expectations are always changing. The why is not, the motivations aren't necessarily gonna change as quickly. Um, but if you can tap into the motivations that allows you to innovate in different ways to meet those motivations and deliver on new things or different things, but still meeting the same reasons why. The other thing that's really important is, is the emergence of self-directed experiences. Um, early, in the, early in this whole, uh, pandemic, we realized that um, organizations who were in performing arts or in organized sports weren't competing with other performing arts or other organized sports activities. They're now competing with a couch and they're competing with walking or biking or, or skiing. Um, and those trends are showing to be a little bit more consistent. Organization or audiences are still interested in, uh, there's pent up interest in reconnecting, but now organizations are going to be competing with those self-directed activities. And it'll be really important for leaders to be able to think, okay, how do I tap into that? What can I offer? And those that offer uh, experiences that uh, build on the self-directed activity um, are going to be and offer meaningful add-ons are going to be really well positioned uh, instead of those that don't necessarily offer anything on top of what's already there. 
So the other thing to note, and we've touched on this, if you followed us from the beginning, is the notion that this experience economy we're talking to, and of course we're talking to the Edmonton Arts Council, but it, it's completely integrated. Um, Albertans have long been experience pursuers rather than ex pursuers of one particular art form, for example. The pandemic hasn't changed that. In fact, um, I would argue that, you know, we're in this kind of new era where we can really uh, pursue more collaboration. I would say the arts community does a great job of that already, but there's probably opportunities to tap that we haven't thought of. We know that before re full re-engagement will occur, regardless of what sector you're in, there's going to be a process of recovery for both consumers and organizations. And then that's gonna be followed by building new habits. So you still need time and patience, but it, the experience economy was integrated before it still is. Uh, and exploring partnerships and collaborations might be the key for a lot of organizations to find their way out of this or to help accelerate that re-engagement. And the final thing to note, uh, we touched on this early on, is that despite passing thresholds, organizations still need to think about safety moving forward. And what we mean by that is um, there is this kind of vaccination threshold, right, that we're all chasing. What that looks like or what that means is, is is one thing, but once we pass that threshold, which we have, and Mentonians have said, this is what I wanna see, and we've seen that, doesn't mean the game has changed completely. Um, we know COVID is still out there. We know the income pressures and then changes in spending habits are still there. So just because we've hit some, some milestones or are we a reopen, it doesn't mean that, the, that COVID's over and that we can stop doing the things we're doing particularly with regards to safety. And, I, and especially for this Edmonton audience, I think this is something that organizations need to still keep in the forefront of their minds and their plannings. Um, so you can really navigate the ups and downs as we you know, go through the fall and winter with a little bit still uncertainty. We might be in a better place than we were last year, but there's still uncertainty out there. And so assuring audience of safety, continuing to do that moving forward, I think is gonna be really important to move us into the next phase. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Kim. Um, and thank you, David and team at Edmonton Arts Council. This is a collaborative resource and we're here to help. If you want more details, everything is available free, 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 detailed data, other reports are all available there. And if you have questions, Abe, we're happy to have chat today. Um, but if you have further questions, uh, please feel free to email us. Either one of the project team is happy to do what they can to help. So with that, um, I turn the microphone back to you and see if there are questions. Candice, Jerry, Tamsin, are there questions that we can answer? David? Thank you so much, uh, Matthew and Kim. This has been invaluable. Um, uh, Jerry, Tamsin, Candice, I'll, I'll, I've got a couple, but I'm, I'd love to hear from you first if you have something you want to ask. Hi, Jerry. Hi. Thanks for the presentation. Um, it, it really does reflect uh, what what we've been finding with our company. Um, yeah, like there's a there's a hesitancy to just jump back into, especially small rooms, yeah. or big crowds, and that there's also, I guess, because we do dance and we've been online, we are finding that there's a whole new market of. Um, people who are uh, homebound, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, would, I would call them the homebound people and the digital does allow us to access that market. So regardless, we're gonna go forward with that hybrid thing, especially with like some classes that are yep. intended to hit the home market. That's awesome to hear because that's an example of innovation. Everybody thinks about adaptation and innovation being this big thing that has to like transform an organization. But it's not, and what you're hitting on, it's not easy, but it is possible. And I think it, it's not just about keeping audiences, as you pointed out, reaching new ones. So good for you, that's great to hear. And um, yes, yeah. oh, sorry, sorry, I would just add to that, uh, Jerry, one of the things that I heard speaking to another group um, a couple of weeks ago in the art sector is that they're looking at uh, hiring new positions that they hadn't even thought about, right? Uh, to offer some of these, um, th because there's now a level of uh, expectation of quality with some of the hybrid offers and the digital that maybe wasn't there when we started this. It was throw it on Zoom and you hope for the best. But now they're realizing that if there is a market for this and if we are going to do this, we're going to do it right. So they're hiring positions that they didn't even have just to support some of these offers. So yes, I do think it's great to see some of these things staying where they work and where they make sense. Mm. 
And I did cut you off. I don't know if you have any, you were going to add something else. I was just, I just wanted to raise a concern about a certain, uh, say like reopening funds that have a minimum audience of 50. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of ambitious in mm -hmm. depending on what kind of arts group you are. Um, that, that can be an ambitious thing to try to reach. Especially yeah, it's, it's interesting because I'm not sure that all policy um, or support tools necessarily follow some of the trends, particularly for organizations that might need it the most. Um, and definitely, I think it depends on the offer and the size of the facility. If you're talking about a facility that's normally 100 and you're going to half capacity, it's going to be tough for a while. Um, and there's no way of saying, oh, if you wait six weeks, it's going to, you'll get to 50%. We just don't know. But uh, that said, I would, I would wager that once we see vaccinations continue to climb, uh, particularly among the older audiences, they see more of the population getting there, then your arts audiences are going to be probably more confident in returning. Mm -hmm. The other thing that we can't discount is the fact that um, there are organizations out there who are taking steps to move forward, right? Um, the Midway in Edmonton, Stampede in Calgary, other festivals happening. I'm coming to Edmonton on Saturday for a concert at Northlands Park. And I think the more and more that those events happen and the less and less people hear that they're a spreader event, those kinds of confidence start to build up in the market. And that's part of a community way of building comfort. And also, Jerry, if uh, your comment was specific to the grant program that I think it's specific to, um, I, there may be a workaround for that that you and I should talk about um, in another context. Sure. Uh, I've got uh, an easy question. Um, we very much enjoyed and, and appreciated the, the rigor and the, the level of insight that this process has brought. Um, but now as individual organizations and as a community, we've got to figure out a way to still uh, monitor some of these, these uh, trends and uh, check in with, with patrons about these kinds of, of changes. How would you recommend that an, organ, an arts organization with finite resources and not, you know, no one with, an, with a degree in market research um, continue to do this work in their own context? Uh, great question. I think um, there's a couple of ways. I think there's a collaborative approach that worked here that I think could probably be adopted across the market. There's enough similarities and value in understanding attitudes and expectations and behaviors and not necessarily specific motivations for your for each product um, that would warrant organizations being able to work together to, to combine resources to do one study. I think that's valuable. Um, the other thing is, is that um, I think over time, if you can do that, I think that's a, a big advantage. And so we're, we're gonna come talk to you guys, David, about that too, because we'd like to do that um, and be able to help the community in Edmonton as much as we possibly can. That would be the first step and I think the best. The other one is don't discount the information you have. They're simple. You have audiences of your own that you reach really, really well. You engage them, you have them on email. Audiences love to be engaged. It's just a matter of doing it well. And there might be opportunities or ways of doing that in simple. Like we can consider coming up to Edmonton and doing a workshop on how to do simple check-ins with your audience, right? As much as we'd love to do them, it's not practical all the time. So you can do it yourself. I mean, that may be an option for us. Um, Tav, Tav, Tamson has a question, so maybe I'll address that. Um, she had, there was asked about, did you capture if people still have the appetite to continue with online offers? It seemed like the interest in online has waned and was that just me? No, it's not just you. Um, I think what we've seen, and we explored this a little bit more in depth a couple of phases of work ago, um, it, it certainly has just waned. So there was an, an interest to start uh, because we had to. And we quickly saw probably within a couple of months that that appetite well, war, you know, for that offering did wane a bit when it came to certain offers. And I think if any of us have kids, we, we can reflect on that and like the Zoom classroom tires fairly quickly. Um, so it did, but what's happened as I had mentioned is that organizations that said, okay, we know there's something here. Um, what they did is they had to pivot a little bit in terms of rather than throwing something online, it has to be used maybe sparingly or for the right product, or it has to be done 
differently with a high production value so it doesn't just seem like we're slapping something on the screen because no there is a limit there's a cap to that um and as gary was saying you know and i think somebody else said in the comments here you are going to be able to reach different people but it's not going to you know be really widespread it is going to be a little bit niche so yes i think there's still a, a, it's waning but there absolutely is still an off appetite to offer some of these online offerings if done well and if timely mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the key to all of that, to add on to Kim's comments, is understanding motivations. Why are they there in the first place? If it's a purely, uh, they want to see a particular artist, then that's much more easily to meet that expectation than it is to say, here, I'm looking for a social experience, right. which aren't as amenable to digital or physical health. Now, that doesn't mean it's not possible. It just means be very deliberate of how you build it in. There's tons of examples of physical fitness class that build in social components to the digital that have garnered lots of audiences. So remember, keep the motivations in mind. And once you know that and cobble it with quality and right production, then you'll probably be well suited to expand your audience. Yeah. Thank you. I'm curious uh, specifically about younger audiences, like age, I don't know, up to age 25, if there were any, any specific information that stood out in that group um a couple and i'll let kim to jump into so it's interesting from a risk perspective they tend to fall into more risk uh risk taker and risk reducer categories they're not very often found in the risk avoider category so they're eager to get back um, but what's interesting about the younger audiences in alberta is is that they're high experience consumers so they're not frequently associated with the arts communities or attendees in arts we tend to think of a certain segment of the population being more ingrained to the arts than others. Um, but the challenge is, is that because of one of translation, quite often arts organizations haven't spoken about the promise of an experience and they go straight to features, which is come see this artist, come see this particular piece of uh, uh, theater or this piece of music or this particular painting instead of the social experiences. So we learned very early on in this research that they're high experience pursuers but we have to talk to them in those terms who have high social motivations and high experiential motivations. So they want to see something unique that's shareable with their friends that has that fun element to it. Mm -hmm. Right. And we've uh, done lots of work on arts engagement in Calgary. And I suspect that it's somewhat translatable to Edmonton and that among the highest engaged uh, audiences with the arts are young audiences under 30, but because of their experience desires, not because of a particular art form. And so to go back to Kim's point about collaboration, that's where it becomes really important so that you can collaborate with sports, you can reach new audiences in ways that people are like, oh, I haven't thought about that. That's interesting. And they'd be receptive to it. Kim, anything you'd add? Yeah, no, I think that you've summed it up beautifully. The only thing I would add is, um, I guess, almost a caution that, um, you know, we tend to speak in broad terms because we have to in research, but you also see that a lot reflected in, in media and this sort of thing. And there's this tendency to paint younger as, reckless right now and they're the ones who aren't getting vaccinated and they're the ones who are doing this and that and I, I just would caution against that I mean as Matthew said they they do tend to be more risk takers uh, but that doesn't mean they're reckless and as he also mentioned you do have them in your sector that they are arts followers and more than anything regardless of putting demographics aside you see some differences um, even though Albertans are pursuers of experiences if you are a dedicated pursuer of the arts and the culture sector, you tend to be a little bit more cautious um, than somebody who is an avid sports or recreation pursuer, mm -hmm. right? If, if you're exclusive in those groups, which is not a lot of people. So if you have younger um, patrons in your sector, they probably have a bit more of a tentative attitude and perhaps younger audience members in a different sector. So I just want to make that distinction, but also caution against that the tendency that we have to blanket, you know, younger versus older, because it isn't universal. Kim just made me think of one last thing. The last thing to keep in mind, their potential is limited with them because of income right now. If you look at youth unemployment, it's at its record levels. And we're seeing lots of events who are looking at their per cap spending as being way down because yeah. they have high proportions of younger audiences who just don't have the spending power they had two years ago. They want to go. Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, they're not going to spend 200. They're going to spend 150 or 100. That helps. Thank you both so much. Uh, Jerry, did you have any other questions? Anything else from questions, but I feel 
feel pretty good so far about this. That's great. Terrific. All right. Uh, then I'm going to say thank you so much um, to, to both of you, uh, both for this presentation today and for a year and a half of uh, guidance and, and insight. We very much appreciate it.